What is blackness? Who is the gatekeeper? Who gets to decide? There's just so many questions and conversations and theories in this episode. I couldn't, we'd be here all day. But the questions they ask, we're gonna leave that for the end. We'll do a little game of our own. I'm thinking, name six things that go with Hennessy. I don't even drink Hennessy. I already filled question one. why my milk and my matcha is not mixing hey loves it's a back on your screen with another one hope you're all well as you can tell today we're discussing atlanta season three episode nine there was so much context conversation starters in this episode i can't wait to hear from you so you know what to do let's get into it this episode opens up with a travis scott track we see a montage of a senior's bedroom you know what they say you can know a lot about a person by the way they set up their space and we get some mixed energy pun intended over here we see scenes of shoes i don't know what those shoes were hitting a post malone poster which is a conversation in itself a lot of people have said post malone is he co-opting the culture, culture vulture? What's the energy with him? I fell out when I saw the Logan Paul jersey. I said, no, I'm not here for this character. I already know. If you know anything about these YouTube streets, I'll just say less. But we also see some other things that kind of indicate that this person with this very deep voice, don't know if it's because I'm legally blind or if it's just a me thing. Anytime I listen to podcasts, I'm like, that person's black or that person's this. I go and Google it and they are what I thought they were, which is insane. There's so much about the intonation of someone's voice minus an accent that can really let you know. I don't know what it is. Roll up on the scene and see that this person who's in the baseball pictures, which you know you can detest, is it a white or black sport? If you go back in history, it says one thing. If you go to present day, it says another. Either way you look at it, this black and white episode is all about duality. There's also themes about colorism, privilege, understanding. There's a lot of big questions like what is blackness? Who gets to gatekeep? artfully done they did it in that you know old school style with the black and white trying to be aesthetic with it he's playing bootleg call of duty or whatever it may be it's called flamethrower i think then he gets a text which upsets him i zoomed in later and i realized it's his girlfriend kate saying i got in don't know why he got irked by that his energy flips and switch i swear this boy is like a light switch he keeps flickering with it he switches both sides he switches energy is a lot of switching going on he starts to flip out on the kids he's playing against because I, I don't know if he was winning at that point. I don't know with these games. I couldn't see that much. All I do know is he started calling them out their name, the N-word. He was really doing the most. I need to see on social media or on public platforms or gaming how quickly people can switch and shift their energy. When he said, go find your dads or something of that sentiment, I said, yo, you went too far. Especially when we find out he's got a black dad. In real life, that actor, Tariq Withers, if I'm not mistaken, he has a black mom, white dad, which you don't see a lot in pop culture, but happens a lot in real life. And I wish they kind of spoke to that story. Speaking of mothers, where is his mom? Because predominantly white looking, he probably has a white mom. Although I will say, he could have two black parents and we just don't know. I say that because my brother, two black parents, lighter than Aaron and got hazel eyes. It happened. I feel like there's so much context and conversation in the first 15 minutes of this episode. I actually preferred the first half of this episode. The second half got a little too stupid for me, but we'll get into that. Let me not rush it. So they're in the car. I think he missed his bus or whatever it is. So his dad's like, yeah, I'm helping you out. Next time you walk the 4K. And they're talking about loans and how he needs a signature in order to get it. His dad says, nope, I get it from one hand, you know. Tough love, that's all we do in this community. We're always tough love to prepare our kids for whatever's to come. I don't have kids yet. One day when I do, I'm gonna ask the question, what are you majoring in? I wish they had let us know. I think for me, that would be a determinant. Because if you're going to school for fufuness, I may not pay for that, I may not sign for that. But if you're going for something that's practical, then we can discuss things a little more. But I wasn't really feeling his dad just shutting him down. I mean, I can see, especially if his dad has loans, he sees the system at work. The loan program we have here, I call the student mafia because the way it's run is really run to run you down. I started paying off my OSAP, which is our student loan, while I was still in school. So I was paying OSAP and tuition. If I had known what I know now, I wouldn't have done it. I paid off my student loan in three years. You don't even wanna know how many jobs I had to do while being legally blind to do that. But I did it because I just, I don't like the feeling of owing and being in debt. So I'm just trying to give the dad some grace and think maybe that's the way. You know, you want to go to this school, you got to find a way kind of sentiment. Or maybe he's just a cheap dad. 
could be that. Whichever way it goes, he said no, hard no. And then when the kid gets to school, his dad says, I love you. There's that mixed energy. Your dad is present in your life and he's sharing affection and affirmation. So can't fault him. I just wish we knew more about the background story. Aaron goes in, his girlfriend hugs him. She got in, she's asking about the loan. He's lying and it's so obvious. Then their other friends roll up and they seem like they have no cares, no problems about getting in. We hear on the PA that there's gonna be an assembly in the auditorium. Remember those days? Oh, those days. So all the seniors are there. The principal, I'm gonna assume, is announcing this philanthropist, entrepreneur, this, that, and the third Christian. I thought it was very interesting the thing she pointed out to say. And then who walks up on the scene? No surprise if you watched the previews last week, the late Kevin Samuels. This episode was giving all type of eerie, especially when you think of the theme of the season in its entirety. We've been talking about ghosts, things coming from the past to return since episode one. And it isn't lost on me that this man lost his life a week to the date of this episode airing. I'm not here for the supernatural ish, but I digress. So he comes on stage, he introduces himself as Robert Shaley. And I try to look up Robert S. Lee, Robert Shaley, nothing came up as the heir of the pink company. You know pink lotion, that thing used to stink up my hair back in the day, but like Kevin Samuel's character said, at least my scalp was oiled. I used it when I didn't know better. He has a million to make it rain on these students. And I'm thinking the math is not mathing. A million is not gonna go far with all these children in these chairs. Then he goes to the mic and says, for the black students. I love how not only did they demonstrate the duality in this episode by the main character who's biracial in real life, by the black and white, but also by the shift of energy and sound. When everyone was getting alone, you get alone, you get alone, you get alone. Robert S. Lee was on his Oprah tip. The energy was more of a monolith, the sound was more in unison. And then when the black kids were the ones that were gonna get the loan, the energy shifts and it's a different sound, not any louder, any less louder, just different. And I think that really speaks to affirmative action and is it fair, why is it in place and that kind of question in context. I don't know, I just feel like the way Atlanta does art, they do it really well. Even when I don't love an episode, I love what they've done with the episode. So here goes this kid with his face fixing it up bad. This next scene where everyone's out in the courtyard, the black kids are dancing on top of the school. It's giving Laquarius an episode one energy. And then we have these clan of kids, yeah, I chose my words right, discussing the situation and how it's unfair. Last time I checked, all of you guys have no problems going to school, whether you get a scholarship or not. But why are you trying to rain on their parade? They wouldn't be able to go. And sometimes even with the scholarship, it's not enough because people can't pay the other 50% or whatever it may be. So let them have their moment. It just was giving hater energy. But also these kind of conversations happen in circles like this. I was really hoping on a star, a very far away one apparently, because the message was not received, that Aaron would stand up for his black side. And I thought, does Aaron's girlfriend Kate know that he's half black? He clearly doesn't identify as that with them because they could fix themselves to say the things they were saying. When she started talking about of a friend of a friend of a friend twice removed that had a black boyfriend who went to school and then got an NBA scholarship and left after a year, I said, what kind of fairy tale is this? What's the name? Oh, I can't remember. Ah, I thought so. I just lost it during that moment because it gave me PTSD. I was triggered. I've had experiences like that, not about that exact subject, but amidst people who are saying things. And I'm thinking, do you not see that I'm black? You can't say that around me. And then having to be that person to correct, I eventually cut those people off because I'm like, I don't want to be in this type of circle or energy. You come to the realization that most of these groups are a monolith. You need that person to step out and stand out. I just thought it was weird that they're complaining when it doesn't really affect them. They're still gonna be able to go to school. It's just they don't get free money when they already had an advantage. I thought that was crazy. Oh my gosh, this next scene had me. When he walks in, I'm thinking he's passing through all these kids trying out for a play. No, no, they're trying to petition for their blackness. I said, those four brown kids can sing with their boys to men. Then we panned through every trope and stereotype of blackness and I'm getting TikTok vibes. This is really paralleling to what Paperboy said a couple episodes ago. Everyone wants to be black and co-opt the culture. But when it's time to be black with the drama, there's a saying about that. I forgot who said it, but it's very true. 
we're trying to give a disadvantaged minority an advantage and then all these other ethnicities want to run in and try to get that times i've heard people complain when there's things and programs in place for black people yes sometimes it can be corrupted let's talk about this week in black lives matter that lady living in a six million house fishy piggybacking off of last week we have the black gay guy coming out holding up the scholarship check like a golden ticket Willy Wonka's factory. I thought that was such a juxtaposition. In some corners of our community, someone would rather accept a biracial, white-passing, Rachel Dolezal-looking person over an unapologetic, unambiguous Black person because of their intersectionality. Based on whatever the other minorities that are at play, they might accept someone who doesn't look Black as Black over this person who is on a there's so much conversation and context in that. I could go off a ledge, but I won't. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> oh, I only got a few chuckles, and some of them came from this next scene when he says, come into the light. That bit was a little eerie. Knowing that Kevin Samuels passed literally a week to this episode airing. Here's a man who in real life puts himself on a pedestal on his platform, pun intended, to judge people and say if they're worthy of a high value man. And in this episode, he's determining if this person is black enough. I don't remember who George Wallace's character, like what his name was, and I don't know who the other person was. I tried to zoom in, but it was too dark for me to see. So if you know, let me know. Tell him, walk into the light. They ask him what his name is. He says, Aaron. I'm laughing when they say it could be a biblical name. Then they start to ask him all these questions, which we're gonna go through at the end for fun. Some of the ones that stood out to me, no, we're not gonna get, I'm just gonna leave that for now because it was just, it was just too much. All you need to know is that homeboy fails a test. He calls him out for telling him that he's not black. They say, you can call your dad, he's black. They're laughing at that. Kind of like the conversation that happens figuratively in the black community. What is blackness? Who gets to co-opt the culture? And what does it mean to be black? It's not just who your lineage is. It's what you know, it's how you, you connect with the culture, right? And there's so much debate and discussion around that because to some people, I'm not black enough by the way I speak. And when I'm in a professional setting, I use my SAT word. Funny that sometimes I'll talk to someone I don't know well and I'll speak that way and they're like, oh, you don't talk like other black people. Or I've even had guys be like, you're not like other black girls. And I'm just, no, there's plenty that I speak eloquently or educated or open-minded. You just haven't opened your mind to go find these people. It really hearkened on that back and forth, that ping pong, the same way our main character's switching, like a light switch between being black or white, is the same way our own community is kind of dictating what is blackness, and it's such a gray area. I only had a few laughs this episode, including when one of the three whispered off-white, but I thought it was interesting that they chose Kevin Samuels to be the middle of this panelist. I almost wish that he had a panel when he'd do his viral videos or his live streams. I only caught a few of them. I knew what he was there for, it was for entertainment purposes. I don't really agree with the at the demise or expensive black women thing, but I already did a podcast if you wanna know my sentiments. I think the man did well for what he did because it's not easy to get on in this social media world, so I'll give him credit for that, but to what expense, you know? Still rest in peace. I don't wish death on anybody. Who gets to be a gatekeeper to the culture? Whether it's you deserve a high value man or you're black, it's kind of the same sentiment. Who gets to sit on that pedestal and say, this is what this is? Aaron goes home, he's vexed, and he gets the idea to build a flamethrower. I said, what in the Columbine is going on? Then he gets to the school, which has been renamed Robert Lee, which it's not far removed from Robert E. Lee, a Confederate leader. So you're switching it from Stonewall Jackson, one problematic slaver, to an... <sighs> it's not missed on me. And then we meet another... I don't remember what the kid's name was, so if you know, let me know down below. We meet the other person who wasn't black enough. We find out that he's Nigerian. And how does Aaron fix himself to say, well, you know, you do have a heritage to go back to? Wait, what? And this really speaks on the conversation between what it means to be African and African-American. Is black African-American or is black the whole diaspora of blackness? And then that tethers to the reparations episode. Who gets reparations? Would it only be descendants of slaves in America or the Caribbeans or South America? When that character said, I'm Nigerian, but I was born here. That really threw me back story time again to a moment when I went to Antigua for the first time. And before this time, whenever someone asked me where I was from or what my ethnicity was, I always said Antiguan. Because in Canada, seldom are you Canadian. You always are whatever your ethnicity is, whether you were born here or not. So when I go there, everyone's like, no, you're Canadian. You don't have an accent. You weren't born here. 
And I was mind blown. I was 11 years old. I'm like, wait, am I not Canadian enough to be Canadian or I'm not black enough to be Antiguan? What am I? And I dealt with this duality for a long time. So I can only imagine what a mixed person goes through because I'm black. But even in my identity, there's still this not conflict, but question, you know, how can this person who doesn't look black tell another person who looks black they're not black because of their heritage? What is black? Come on, we ain't got the answer yet. Words are exchanged, bad jokes are exchanged. I wasn't here for this scene. Then they start to run through the school as if they're living out this game with their build of flamethrowers. Where do they get the kit from? No, your black cards are revoked because black kids would not go to a school to burn it down if things didn't go their way. They would just realize this is real life, okay? They shoot the black kid just before he's about to flamethrow Aaron. I was appalled. I said, they really went there? Luckily, the kid wasn't killed. Robert. As Lee comes over, he's horrified that they try to burn down his school. At first, it sounds like he's condoning and scolding the boy. Then he says, being shot is the blackest thing you could do. He hands some money to the paramedic. Did you see that slip? Says, take him to the white gurney. They say Emery's like the white gurney. I love how he repeats it. If you guys don't know, the gurney is a old, old, old segregated hospital. And I guess they didn't offer the same level of care. The way a lot of segregated establishments weren't on par with the whites back in the day. So him saying take him to the white gurney is like make sure that this kid lives. Then he says he's going to pay the medical bill and he hands him a scholarship check. I'm done. That's when I really had a good laugh. And I said, you know what? This episode wasn't all bad. <laughs> Then we see Aaron in the back of the car, and I said, your father foreshadowed that. The way he was speaking in the car when he dropped you off to school, he set you up in this plot line to end up right there. One year later, homeboy's got a fade, and he's brushing emphatically, trying to get them waves. I don't see no waves. The real-life actor is 24, so he wasn't really giving high school to begin with, but I'm like, yo, you grew up quite a bit in a year. You cut your hair, you got the chain, the black tee, you're working at the bootleg Best Buy. He's giving Lawrence from insecurities. <laughs> I love how he's trying to spit game to the black girl, say, use my code. Are you going to call me? When she walks away, he's like, that ass. I'm just like, why are you... Why? Then his ex, his old work comes. Kate, I guess she's a freshman in college. She ended up going to Arizona. What's the deal? Is that a good school? I want to know. I do know Arizona is predominantly white. I don't know if that changed with the panorama and people moving from New York and LA to cheaper places. I said this man is on his fuckboy, wasteboy-ish talking about I'm more attracted to you than ever. I'm like, this is all you're good for now? Who knows? Maybe he's saving up to go to school. Maybe he's going to community college. There's tons of great institutions in Georgia that he could be going to. Maybe this is him code switching again or switching up or embracing or maybe whatever he endured with the PO situation. He just decided, you know what, whatever. If you're gonna see me as black, let me be black. There's a lot of commentary on that, but that's when I leave my synopsis. There was definitely some callbacks to other episodes, including the episode with Wiley about the universal group, talking white and black, that kind of duality. Also, this idea of dressing black when they were ripping him apart and saying, your black friends wouldn't let you wear those shoes. It's so interesting because a lot of times on the playground or even in social media, people kind of dictate and say, what is blackness or what does it mean to look or dress or be urban? I hate that term. So many public figures I can think of that choose to be one or the other when they feel like it, even if they're neither. Did my candles burn out? Oh, dang. I've been talking for a long time. The candles are out. Let's wrap up by playing this game. Answer the questions that the panel asked him. Name six things you can mix Henny with. I don't drink Henny. I don't know. I know a lot of people do Henny and Hip, Henny and Coke, Henny and Ginger. That's about all I know. I know they love Henny. This is the fourth time they mentioned it in the series. I hope Hennessy is running them a check. <laughs> How long can chicken stay on a stove? I said, wait, while cooking? Because curry chicken is different from stew chicken. But if you've turned off the stove, that's a whole different question. This next question is a mess. Bobby and Whitney or Will and Jada? At first, I was like, you rewrote that in recently. But then I realized, no, looking back at it, Will and Jada have been problematic and toxic for a minute. It's funny that they chose two toxic pairs. Why couldn't we have a duo that is couple goals? Healthy couple goals. They didn't say future in his seven baby mamas, I mean. Where's the first place you take your cousin when they get out of jail? I don't have any cousins that are in jail. I would say Golden Corral, like they mentioned, that would be his graduation gift. I'm done. I love Golden Corral though. Anytime I go to the States with family, we hit it up. 
Or I would say Waffle House. Never been, but everyone's always talking about Waffle House. Or the wing spot that Rick Ross owns. I heard that lemon pepper chicken is it. Falling out when he was saying ran random things. NBA young boy, silk pillowcases, Megan Trainor. I said, what are they asking you? And he says, you put your foot in it, it means it's good. I was like, what? This moment was almost paralleling what it's like to do an admissions interview. And even when he answered the question of what happened to the boy in Lennox, and he gave that typical textbook answer instead of what he told his dad in the car earlier. Cause you know, the energy flipped there too. And they're like, nope, the right answer is mm-mm, mm-mm. Your mama or your mother? Who's calling anyone their mother out here? Isn't it mom? Holy spirit or holy ghost? <laughs> I would say spirit. Take this pencil and make a beat out of it. I don't even think kids these days know what that is. Cause everyone's using Apple pencils. So pencil to wet table. In the metaverse, there's not gonna be any of this anyway. What color are Wendy's napkins? I was like, shoot, do people really go to Wendy's like that? And I was thinking, isn't it white and then the Wendy's chick is colored? It's the same thing when you realize that Starbucks is a siren and you're like, what kind of sorcery is this? Spell Dante, I'm done. <laughs> There's a lot of names that have hyphens and asante goons and all types of hieroglyphics in it. So I'm not mad at them for asking that, but I'm like, you're doing the most. DQ or Popeyes, wait. Does Dairy Queen in the States have chicken? Cause here I'm pretty sure it's just ice cream. So how could you compare the two? If Neo's hat gets any lower, it's blank. What? <laughs> okay, so maybe this episode wasn't the most hilarious and nothing tops episode eight of the season so far. But overall, I'm not mad at it. After talking with you guys, I actually enjoy it more. So I, I'm grateful that you guys have given me the opportunity to give my commentary. I just wanna say a quick thank you for all of you who've taken the time to comment respectfully, let me know your thoughts, add, maybe even correct me sometimes. I really appreciate each and every one of you. I hope to see you next week for the season finale. I can't even believe that we're already done. Like, I need five more episodes. If we have five more episodes of just the main characters, to set the scene and just even wrap up some loose ends. Cause I got a lot of questions. There's no way they can answer it in under an hour next week, but we'll see. As always, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. Until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed, love and later.